to, to move on with the evening is because uh, General Petraeus, as David Gergen mentioned, is uh, testifying before Congress tomorrow. And so unfortunately, he'll actually have to leave right after uh, his, his address this evening. Now, usually in the military, when they ask you to do something again, it's because you screwed it up the first time. So <laughs> with that in mind, here we go. I could re easily reintroduce General Petraeus to you by reciting another long list of his accolades without repeating a single one from the list I mentioned this afternoon. But instead, I want to tell you something about him you might not suspect. For someone who is so unflappable in the face of the gruelingly long, the unremittingly inquisitive, and the often intensely illogical questioning of Congress, he's also a lot more fun than you might imagine. It's quite a feat to get nominated by GQ magazine as the leader of the year while wearing a green polyester suit with a lot of bling. In Iraq, General Petraeus had a fast pair of custom Blackhawks that he flew, or flew him around Baghdad twice a day, six or seven days a week so that he could work down the hall from Ambassador Crocker at the embassy after beginning the day with General Odierno in the military command at Camp Victory. With a perception for detail that is truly uncanny, he would note the changes in the Baghdad scene from the air, the lights on at night, the activity in the streets, the checkpoints and traffic jams, as one more gauge of what progress his new strategy was making. It's amazing, he told me on one of these nights, how the pilots actually do what you tell them. I say go left, and they turn left. I say turn right, and they turn right. Any of us ground pounders like the general know how unusual this is for the high and mighty of the air wing. There was one time I remember though that it, when it didn't go exactly as advertised, my team was catching a ride back from the embassy with him, and he said, well, let's go check out Automia. And the pilot said, sorry, sir, but it's hot there tonight, and the airspace is black. With that, he sat up, his face brightened, and he said, well, that's what we have our M60s for, right? It sounds like they could use two more in the fight. Whether in a helicopter or anywhere else, I have never met a senior military officer more opposed to military bureaucracy than General Petraeus. My team of Marines worked for him in the field, and it was amazing how much time he took to look out for us. One time, a year and a half ago, we ran into every bureaucratic hurdle imaginable, and then about a dozen or so that were completely unimaginable when it came to trying to simply get a Humvee. When we finally had to bother the boss about this, General Petraeus told the Corps staff to give us his own, which he keeps on standby at Camp Victory. It wasn't a threat, it was a completely generous offer and sincere offer. That's simply the kind of leader that he is. Needless to say, when the lieutenant colonel giving us the runaround was handed the choice between assigning the MNFI commander's Humvee to three Marines and finding another one, we got our Humvee. <laughs> For all the times he was there to send us his encouragement and support, however, there was one significant exception. All of us in the room tonight should know and understand the rivalry the healthy rivalry, the healthy competitive spirit between the Army and the Marine Corps. And with that in mind, I hope that every one of you can appreciate how utterly embarrassing it is as a Marine captain to not be able to beat an Army general who's 27 years your senior in a six mile run. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the fastest man in the room, General <laughs> David Petraeus. Well, thanks very much for that, Seth, uh, and thanks for doing it three times today. God bless you. Uh, thanks for reminding folks uh, the real pleasure that I used to take when I could actually give somebody or something an order and actually have them follow it. <laughs> the fact that the helicopter actually went left when you said go left was uh, a real pleasure. 
uh, as he would attest, you know, when you tell an infantry unit to turn left, maybe 50% of it turns left. 20% uh, just keeps going straight because it didn't get the word. Another 20% probably turns right and 10% is asleep. <laughs> uh, but he's really reminded me of some great days and some great moments. And gosh, thanks for reminding me the the, the GQ man of the man of the year. I mean, I didn't even have to wear Armani. Um, but for those who weren't at the event this afternoon, I should explain uh, a little bit about Seth because he really was one of our true most valuable players in Iraq, a Marine who served in combat, earned a Bronze Star Medal for Valor, leading his Marines in the Battle of Najaf in 2004, who then volunteered to extend his time in Iraq to serve on what we came to call Team Phoenix, an organization of several extraordinary and very bright Marines who knew Iraq, who were capable of independent action, and who demonstrated exceptional initiative. Their simple task was to get the infrastructure built for the Iraqi Security Force units in areas where US units weren't present. This during the time that I was in charge of standing up the organization responsible for recruiting, training, and equipping Iraqi Security Forces and for building their barracks, bases, academies, and so on. Seth and his colleagues operated in the five provinces just south of Baghdad, again, where non-US elements were in charge. And I'd touch down in that area every couple of weeks in my helicopter, pick up a rucksack of Team Phoenix project proposals, take them back to my headquarters in Baghdad, where the staff expedited approval of all their projects, disapproval not being an option. Anyway, Seth and his team made a huge impact. Lieutenants working, in effect, at that time, directly for a lieutenant general. Again, nothing like a flat command structure when you want to get something done. There were also invaluable sources of information and insight who often were the United States to the Iraqi security force leaders and Iraqi citizens in those provinces where they operated. Beyond all that, I remain particularly grateful to Seth and to two of his other team members, Ann Gilderoy and Alex Lemons, for volunteering, I emphasize volunteering, to be recalled to active duty for yet another tour in Iraq when I went back there in February 2007 to oversee the surge. During that tour, they returned to their former AO, reestablished old relationships, and proved instrumental during the effort to break the grip of Muqtada al-Sadr's militia in Diwaniya and several other locations in the surrounding provinces. So thanks, Seth and Alex and Anne, in absentia, very much uh, for all that you did during our time there. Before I go further, I also um, want to thank the, the uh, band members uh, who have been here, the color guard uh, to whom we already gave coins, uh, and to the other Harvard ROTC cadets with us this evening. Being part of the great Paul Revere Battalion with cadets from the awesome Massachusetts Institute of Technology, <laughs> you are certainly part of the ROTC unit that high, has the highest average IQ in the nation other than Princeton's. <laughs> I'm just joking, you know. <laughs> I know, but thanks for laughing. I'm only as good as the material they give me. Um, on a serious note, uh, is, is Master Sergeant Segretti here still? Why don't you stand up? Because this man right here is the man who trained uh, that color guard. He earned a silver star in combat in Fallujah, uh, and he is a great role model and a great source of energy and example to those cadets in the Paul Revere Battalion. Thanks for all you've done. And thanks again. I want to add my thanks as well to all those who have helped make this evening possible through their generosity, through their contribution of time, money, organizational ability, uh, all of us here are very grateful to the tribute that you have given uh, to the veterans in this community here this evening. Uh, and thanks David uh, Gergen, by the way, for reminding me of tomorrow's uh, testimony. Uh, <laughs> nothing concentrates the mind like the prospect of testifying in the morning. <laughs> and, uh, and thanks for all that you and, and Dean Elwood and your teams have done to honor and to recognize and to include those who have served so fully in all that you do. Uh, I was going to add my recognition uh, to that of uh, the others for Ken Fisher, 
uh, Drew's very eloquent description of what the Fisher House Foundation has done for our soldiers and their families uh, described very nicely, I think, uh, what that means uh, to those who are supporting their troopers in their hours of greatest need when they're recovering from very serious injuries uh, on the battlefield or even on the training field. And I was going to mention that the last time I saw Ken uh, was for a wonderful event aboard the USS Intrepid. You know, it's the only family in America that went out and purchased an aircraft carrier and then parked it off Manhattan and made a museum out of it. And as I was thinking back to the, that evening, I was reminded of a story I heard there, one that I think some of the Harvard students here might be interested in hearing. Apparently, a Harvard Law School student had caused a near altercation in a Manhattan bar near the Intrepid earlier that week. Now, I'm not sure how a Harvard Law student had the time to be in Manhattan on a weeknight, as there reportedly is a moderately demanding curriculum at Harvard Law, <laughs> but apparently he did, unlike the Kennedy School, I know. Um, <laughs> no time there. Anyway, the way I heard it, the way I heard it, he leaned over to the guy next to him at the bar and asked, want to hear a Yale Law School joke? Giving the hard, Harvard student a hard look, the guy next to him replied, before you tell that joke, you should know something. I'm six foot five inches tall and weigh 230 pounds, and I attend Yale Law School. The guy right here next to me is six foot two, weighs 225, and he's a Yaley too. And the guy next to him is six three, weighs 230, and he's a Yaley as well. Now, you still want to tell that joke? Nah, I guess not, the Harvard Law student said. Not if I'm going to have to explain it three times. <laughs> Well, you know the problem with some of these jokes, they have no relation to what I'm going to say for the rest of the evening. <laughs> but having endured many an Army-Navy joke in my day, I know that gratuitous bashing of an arch rival is always a good way to open a speech. <laughs> and now that I've hopefully endeared myself sufficiently to the Harvard students for the rest of the evening, I'd also like to thank the many Harvard University staff and faculty members present tonight. Again, to Dean Elwood, Professor Gurdon, all the Harvard faculty with us on behalf of all here who wear or have worn our nation's uniform, I want to express our deep appreciation for your efforts to honor Harvard's veterans and for your welcoming the inclusion of their experiences and perspectives in your class, classrooms and academic fora. Thank you very much for that. Of course, as you all realize, we have some true national treasures from our armed forces patrolling the halls of Harvard these days. And obviously, the tables here are filled with them. Uh, each of them, I think, could be recognized by name this evening, and I wish I could do that. Uh, but obviously, it's not possible to do so. But I did want to single out just one more representative of those here tonight, as he typifies the excellence of those military men and women who compete for a place in the various wonderful programs here in Cambridge. Somewhere among the crowd tonight is Captain Walt Cooper, who's studying international relations uh, en route to a PhD. Walt's a West Point graduate, a Rhodes Scholar, who's completed multiple deployments as a Special Forces team leader from Iraq to Europe to Africa. I first met him in southern Iraq, where he and his unit partnered with a group of Iraqi police commandos to help bring security to their area. This was in a tough period. It was a time in 2007 when we were struggling to get traction against the Shia extremists, and he and his Special Forces A team had achieved impressive progress in that regard. Walt has, in fact, been a remarkable leader in our Army, and now he's going to take some of his experience, plus the perspectives that he will have gained here at Harvard, back to West Point to teach international relations in the incomparable Department of Social Sciences. And I cannot imagine a better role model for the cadets than Walt. The fact that our military can point to leaders like Seth, like Walt, like Drew Sloan is impressive. However, they are by no means unique. In truth, the service of each of the veterans here tonight could be the source of similar stories of courage, selflessness, and commitment. And again, I hope they won't feel slighted by not receiving an individual call out, as each has more than earned one. In fact, throughout our military ranks, there are innumerable brave, skilled, smart, 
dedicated professionals who have volunteered to perform the hard tasks that our country has assigned to our military. And there have been countless times and countless places in the past eight years in particular when uncommon valor has been a common virtue. Throughout my time in Iraq and in my time in the CENTCOM area of responsibility since leaving Iraq, I have continually been impressed by our troopers and by leaders like those in this room. They really are, as Tom Brokaw observed to me in northern Iraq one time, America's new greatest generation, young Americans who represent the very best of what our nation has to offer. Our men and women in uniform in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places around the world serve selflessly in the face of enormous challenges, repeatedly demonstrating impressive initiative, innovativeness, courage, and determination. They soldier on in crushing summer heat and harsh winter cold, battle tough, barbaric, adaptive enemies, and grapple with the complexities and frustrations of working in cultures vastly different than our own. They routinely put themselves in harm's way for our country, for innocent civilians, and above all, for their comrades on their left and right. And they know personally and deeply the emotions that bind those men and women who have become part of the brotherhood of the close fight. I consider myself particularly privileged to have served with so many members of the new greatest generation for nearly four years in Iraq. This room is again filled with individuals who have not only been members of the new greatest generation, but leaders in it. And what I'm really here to do tonight is simply to say to each of them, thank you. And with that, I'd ask that you allow me to devote the remainder of my remarks this evening to speak directly to the veterans in this room. First and foremost, thanks for serving. Each of you raised your right hand and said, send me when your country needed you. There was tremendous courage in your decision to do so, for you knew that it meant you would deploy into harm's way. So thank you for stepping forward and sacrificing all that you did to serve and to deploy, for some of you on multiple occasions, to a combat zone to fight our nation's wars. Second, thanks also for your commitment to learning, and to learning not just in a combat zone, but in the halls of academia as well. Good leaders strive to complement their experience with study and to inform their study with experience. And as I'm sure many of you have discovered, there is nothing like a great academic environment to pull you outside your intellectual comfort zone, challenging your assumptions and very ways of thinking. And what a privilege to do so at a place many consider to be our country's most significant intellectual critical mass. I personally discovered the joys and challenges of being transported outside my intellectual comfort zone and acquired a healthy dose of intellectual humility during my own graduate studies at Princeton. I arrived there in 1983 with a reasonable degree of self-confidence, having just won the George C. Marshall Award as the top graduate of the U.S. Army's Command and General Staff College and after having had a number of articles published in various journals. And to this day, I count myself very fortunate to have spent two years at the Woodrow Wilson School. I'll never forget a number of the experiences there, among them receiving a very memorable comment from Professor Richard Ullman on the first paper I submitted to him. Professor Ullman, a Harvard grad I might note with a PhD from Oxford under George Kennan, was also at the time the editor of Foreign Policy Magazine among many other accomplishments. On what I thought was an incisive analysis of change and continuity in American foreign policy in the 20th century, he wrote, and I quote, though this paper is well written and has some merit, it strikes me as relatively simplistic, and I am left feeling that the whole is less than the sum of the parts. <laughs> as, as my son would say, snap. <laughs> but in truth, in truth, that was very useful. It challenged me to a considerable degree. And I worked hard to redeem myself in Professor Ullman's eyes and in my own. And I'm happy to note that I did get an A-plus in the final paper and that Professor Ullman eventually became my dissertation advisor, a wonderful mentor, and a true friend. But that and a number of other events provided some very salutary experiences during my time in grad school. Besides that, like many of the veterans here, I'm sure, I enjoyed a number of those very illuminating and useful occasions during which one realizes 
wow, these folks really don't think like I do. <laughs> Frankly, it was very instructive for me to discover that really bright, really thoughtful, and really well-educated folks had different points of departure on very basic issues than did many in uniform at the time. And such experiences were invaluable for me. And it sure helps to help have, it sure helps to have them before you find yourself, for example, the so-called king of northern Iraq, dealing with leaders of different ethnic and sectarian backgrounds who definitely didn't think the way we did. In fact, leadership in today's environments, whether in Iraq or Afghanistan or in the commercial sector or domestic political arena, requires thoughtful, nuanced, adaptive, out-of-the-box thinkers. People who recognize the range of views held by others and the need, on occasion, to have the wisdom of our views challenged at the least. And I'm sure that your experiences here have helped you acquire such qualities, or if you already have them, to strengthen them. So again, thank you for your decision to push yourself intellectually. I'm certain that you will leave here enriched and with a wealth of new intellectual capital on which you can draw in the future and that our nation will benefit as a result of your time here. Third and finally, thanks for the contributions I know you'll make in the future. For those of you who will be returning to the ranks of our military, our missions in Iraq and Afghanistan will require your ability to conduct complex counterinsurgency operations, to train and work with indigenous forces, and to help local governments achieve legitimacy, establish basic services, and revive markets and commerce. I know that you will use all that you've learned here to be even better leaders for our troopers as they undertake the multifaceted and exceedingly difficult missions on which we're currently embarked. For those of you not returning to uniform, our nation needs leaders and world changers in its civilian ranks more than ever before. And I know that you will take the knowledge and experience you acquired here at Harvard to the civilian world with an eye towards serving the greater good that you have already served so ably in the ranks of our military. I'm sure that you will use your experiences un in uniform to inform the security and foreign policies you help develop, the legal interpretations you help write, the commercial innovations you help pioneer, and the social changes you help forge. Countries grappling with historic economic, political, and social challenges await your leadership, energy, and example. I'd like to conclude tonight by recalling some wonderful words from Teddy Roosevelt's famous man in the arena speech, words with which many of you will undoubtedly be familiar, but which never fail to inspire. It is not the critic who counts, Roosevelt stated, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasm, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Each of you here tonight who has served our country in uniform and has been in the arena, arguably the ultimate arena, helping to fight our nation's wars, we are indebted to you. All Americans, regardless of their views on those wars, appreciate and are grateful for your service and sacrifice. Some of you will be returning to the military arena. Indeed, you'll once again be leaders in that arena, and we look forward to your return. But the greater arena is big, and the needs are many. And those who have taken the final pass in review in uniform and who will now turn to serving our nation, our economy, our world, and civilian capacities, you too will be returning to the arena. So tonight is an occasion on which we say thanks to all of you. Thanks for what you have achieved in previous tours in the arena. Thanks for what you will achieve when you return to the arena. And above all, thanks for choosing to be in the arena. Thank you very much. So, 
officer on behalf of the service members, veterans, and the larger Harvard community, we want to thank you for taking the time out from your, your, from your busy schedule to come and talk to us this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.